Good morning and welcome to the session, a worldwide web of water warriors, social media's impact on local environmental movements. Oh, I'm sorry, that's your paper. <laughs> okay, let me just go ahead and move into the bios. <clears throat> Dr. Victoria Machado received her PhD from University of Florida where she specializes in religion in nature and religion in the Americas. Victoria's research explores the spirituality within Florida's environmental movement, examining the religious dimensions of activists and their quest to protect Florida's water. She is currently a visiting assistant professor in the Environmental Studies Department at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, where she teaches nature spirituality, environmental history, environmental literature, and environmental crisis in its cultural context. Victoria also serves on the Teacher Advisory Council for the National Humanities Center and works as an on-call ocean lifeguard. She will be presenting first, and I've already read the title of her paper. Our next speaker will be Theodore Kamara. He is in his third year of studies, pursuing a Master's of Divinity in Advanced Biblical Studies at Northeastern Seminary. He is passionate about the intersections between faith and culture, especially regarding the topic of climate change. He hopes to continue toward his PhD in ecological theology, but is currently doing scholarly work in hopes of advancing the field before he is able to gain these degrees. His paper is, In TikTok We Trust, The Double-Edged Sword of Social Media in the Battle Against Climate Misinformation Within American Christianity. Our final speaker is Mitchell Hickman, who is a PhD student in the Religious Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Studying at the crossroads of philosophies of technology and religion, Mitchell is interested in the theoretical limitations of secularization and examines the ways in which digital technologies and technologically mediated virtual worlds impact and revel novel modes of meaning making in the 21st century. His paper will be playing deliberately what video games have to teach us about self and world. And without further ado, here is Dr. Machado. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I will kind of start my presentation by saying this is um, fairly new, um, so it's not fully sifted through. So maybe you can help me with that with conversation afterwards. Um, okay. A woman dressed in a seminal patchwork shirt, face worn squinting into the sun, stands chest deep in the middle of the Everglades. Surrounded by sawgrass with her arms raised high, she holds a sign that reads, I am the Everglades, hashtag defend the sacred. The image is a snapshot from a 13 second TikTok video in which the woman, Miccosukee grandmother Betty Osceola of the Panther Clan, invites her audiences to share how many miles they are from the Everglades and join her in defending the sacred. When closely analyzed, this image evokes a range of questions from embodiment to gender to politics. We can read such images as living texts within, quote, the domain of everyday existence, practical activity, and shared understandings, a nod to Orsi's lived religion. However, within the context of lived religion, and more specifically, uh, religion and technology, perhaps the most striking aspect of this image is the subtle yet broader human nature story that arises and how the message cultivates conversations that cross geographic, cultural, and socio-political boundaries and barriers. From embodiments of the sacred natural world to depictions of the fight against Nestle's water bottling facilities, 
Florida's water activists join other environmentalists in the quest to cross a range of barriers as they use social media to keep their messages at the forefront of their supporters' minds. Sarah McFarland Taylor refers to this as the restoring of the restoring the earth, the ongoing processes of mediated moral engagement and recrafting or remaking stories of earth and our place in it in an age of environmental crisis. Operating at the nexus of spirituality and secularity, activists are engaging in the act of restoring by cultivating a narrative about the importance and more so the sacrality of Florida's water thereby keeping the calls to protect the sacred as, an embody, as embodied in the water is life mantra, alive. Rooting my research in Taylor's discussions on media narratives, this paper argues that activists, especially those who frame water issues within the lens of the sacred, engage social media to shift and sustain the narrative of Florida's water stories, moving the perception of water from a managed resource to a point of reference. And if you're familiar with Taylor's eco-piety, this is comparable to David Corton's shift from sacred money to sacred life. So based off of nine years of ethnographic field work in which I unknowingly uh, relied heavily on, um, envir on social media in an effort to stay engaged with informants um, in between environmental actions and events, and we can talk more about that, that kind of unknowingly stumbling upon this. Uh, my research provides insight into how activists grapple with navigating online communities and negotiating their message on a platform that knows no boundaries. So following Matteo Crincion's uh, social media activism, water as a common good, I find the relationship between social movement actors and digital technologies to be mutual. In other words, the actors influence social media and social media influences the actors, thereby cultivating a new story that works with them and influence this, influences them. Taylor explains this reciprocity as a larger, quote, project and process of moral engagement within the context of participatory, participatory culture and mediated backtalk. She writes, quote, as we tell our stories, they in turn tell us. So with this basis, the following explores three instances of how narratives about Florida's water are cultivated by activists, thereby cultivating wider networks, reinforcing community bonds, and most of all, sharing this collective restory about the environment. So first, I will explore the live-streamed interfaith prayer walks by considering how issues of spirituality come to the forefront of the movement in order to spread awareness about water's interconnection. Next, I look at how local culture and folklore combine with the larger Water is Life movement to bring attention to water bottling of a beloved, of a beloved and sacred spring. And finally, I will return to the Defend the Sacred TikTok example to show how such efforts and narratives not only cross, cross boundaries, but lay the foundation for engagement in a collective narrative to restore the earth. So together, these examples show how social media presents a platform in which to craft broader stories about ourselves and about the world around us. In doing so, activists and advocates are calling um, are, are following the call of scholars like Taylor and Corton by restoring present day nar narratives about how broader publics view the earth and the natural world. So uh, kind of jumping into this, um, a prime example of, arises in the Honoring Our Sacred Water Facebook group. This was created in 2016. It's based out of Fort Myers, Florida. Um, and the group has both national and international reach. So while the 684 members locate themselves around Florida, many identify their home as outside of the state in areas like California, Michigan, Vermont, and New Jersey. And still others identify themselves outside of the US entirely in places like Singapore. And the founder of the group, Holly Rowan, who also co-founded the Southwest Florida Pachamama Alliance, manages the group as a place for global prayers and affirmations that honor our sacred water. 
So the space is specifically for positive speech and events that protect the water. And she's known for hosting sacred water ceremonies on the west coast of Florida and co-hosting and providing aid to various prayer walks for Lake Okeechobee, which have been the spotlight of this group. So Rowan's prayer walk co-host, Betty Osceola, the woman introduced at the beginning of this paper, has led at least two walks around Lake Okeechobee and a handful of other prayer walks throughout the Everglades. Though the walks are mostly meditative, they bring attention to local issues plaguing the glades, such as cyanobacteria in the water, oil drilling, water flow or lack thereof, and development. And while some of the walks are a day or so, um, others require a longer commitment. So it usually takes Osceola seven days to traverse the 112 mile circumference of Lake Okeechobee, Florida's largest lake. And the walks are done in, silent in, an effort, uh, in silence in an effort to bring attention and awareness to the natural world. Um, however, Rowan and Osceola both use social media at specific times throughout their journey in order to check in with and educate online followers who did not have the ability to take part in the journey. Rowan provides live streamed video check-ins before the walkers embark each morning, whereas Osceola, who leads the walks, takes time during breaks and at the end of, day, at the, end of the day just before camp set up to live stream updates on the prayer walkers. In both cases, social media uses a two-way street uh, Rowan and Osceola both welcome viewers and respond to their questions and comments, thereby facilitating a dialogue between those on the ground and those tuning in. Individuals from around the world offer their own prayers for the water in their specific watersheds, reinforcing unity and connectivity of water. This was the case with blessings, songs, and prayers that came in the form of video posts from local areas like the Mangrove School of Sarasota, as well as more distant regions like Canada's Jasper National Park. So written and spoken words accompany such videos of moving water, thereby reinforcing the main message that the waters are sacred and they must be honored and viewed as life. So as Crinison uh, reminds us, the the relationship between technology and movement builders is mutual. And this is most evident in the live streamed updates and the timely video posts. In these respects, uh, the Facebook groups are less of an online text forum and more of an active in real time conversation. For observers, there is no doubt that there are real people organizing and promoting change, cultivating creative community and sustaining the broader ideas that water is important. With a special thanks to social media platforms, environmental videos are met with audience engagement, deepening their message while also spreading it to others who reinforce the narrative with their own examples of sacred water. More specifically, the impact is cyclical in that environmentalists share an online video and it sparks another environmentalist to share the importance of their local water bodies, um, such as the Jasper National Park one. So these separate, inst uh, these separate uh, experiences become a shared reality, connecting both parties to the wider world of water issues and growing this larger connective um, network of support going forward. And we can talk about this within the case of miscommunication, which I think someone else will be talking about as well. Um, so in many ways, these interactions show the ephemeral nature of water activism alongside environmental efforts to ground campaigns and overarching narratives in place. So again, as Crinison uh, helps us to highlight um, how social media can impact social mobilization by introducing a new in part placelet, and this is their quote, a uh, placeless environment of interaction the quote, online public water sphere, and comparable to his study, which examined the rise of social media activism surrounding water privatization in Italy, a similar space surfaces within the networks of Florida's environmental, environmental activists. So the Honoring Our Sacred Water Facebook group becomes a placeless space of grounding community, connection and ideas that perpetuate this larger narrative of the water as a sacred entity. 
and the irony results from the placelessness that it centers on. So in other words, the engagement occurs on the web. The primary, uh, the primary reason behind such a engagement is centered on specific locations that are known and loved. And in this respect, the engagement mimics the fluidity of water flowing from one space to another space, one forum to another, in some sense being everywhere at once. So by embracing such technologies, activists, particularly those who operate at the intersection of activism and spirituality, who may be attracted to the issues for different reasons, are building a global conversation surrounding the importance of the earth and its natural resources. It's shifting the way they do activism. Um, and I want us to move on to the next, uh, the next example. Um, these interconnected narratives are not limited to religious or spiritual practitioners. In fact, secular water or secular environmental groups and people are also perpetuating the sacrality of water through water is life narratives and their social media interactions. So their interactions blur the lines when it comes to spirituality. Uh, linking their message to Water is Life in that call from Standing Rock, the Boycott Jenny Springs Facebook page calls upon water protectors and water warriors to help stop Nestle from acquiring a water per permit to ga uh, bottle gallons of local spring water. So engaging the ethos of an indigenous-led movement, they take this a step further by drawing from the power of local culture, mysticism, and lore, and this is exemplified through Mermaid Michi, who uses her identity as a mermaid within her short 40-second video that calls for refusing Nestle's request to bottle spring water. And the video features a woman in full mermaid tail under the local springs holding a sign that reads, Water is life, not profit, no to Nestle. And this flips between a series of, the video will flip between a series of homemade uh, signs and then under the water, but ultimately at the very end she, she swims down, she picks up this um, bottle of water this, uh, that has been trashed and she shakes her, she shakes her uh, uh, finger no in disgust. And though mermaids might seem like out of place activists, uh, Mermaid Michi builds upon previous efforts by water protectors while also providing a local cultural mysticism to her message. With the help of underwater theaters and air hoses, mermaids were really big in Florida in the 1940s. Um, and their, um, their narrative kind of uh, goes beyond that, um, particularly when we're thinking more specifically about like the Spanish conquistadors who are coming. They often would um, uh, mistake manatees for mermaids. So like the lore is, is fairly um, deep. Um, but by bridging the local mythical narratives of old Florida with present day globalized indigenous efforts made famous by Standing Rock, um, she's able to perpetuate a restoried understanding of Florida's water for both activists and longtime locals invested in Springs restoration. And I'm going to move on to the next one for the sake of time. Um, from the creation of wider networks to the reinforcement of community bonds, restoring the social media um, through, so, so, through social media allows activists to engage broader audiences while also appealing to their local grassroots supporters. So for this final section, I'd like to return to the defend the sacred image we started with in an, um, and the efforts and narratives that not only cross boundaries but lay the foundation for engagement in the sacred earth restory. Um, and I'm going to just show you the actual, um, I'm going to show you the actual video here so you can get a sense. My name is Betty Osceola. I am the Everglades. Defend the sacred. I want to know how many miles you are from the Everglades and I want you to defend the sacred. So by identifying as the Everglades, Betty Osceola uses her identity as an indigenous woman to speak to the larger historical, socio-political atmosphere surrounding the region. Imbued with such meanings, um, or imbued with meanings, such messages highlight issues of human nature interactions, ecofeminism, animism, and embodiment. And while each of these topics can be explored in a range of ways, above all, this exemplifies how activists create, build, and perpetuate messages 
that are broadcast into the wide world of social media. Um, and though simple, Osceola's message spread throughout a range of Florida environmental Facebook groups, and it's um, propelled environmentalists from around Florida and around the world to post their own images. Um, My name is Betty Osceola. I am the Everglades. And so they often post them side by side in duets. Um, it's a split screen that you, on one side, you have the original uh, video, and then on the other side, you will either have a, another video or um, a static image like this one. So there have been others like this. My name is Betty Osceola. I am the Everglades. And in some cases, people are upwards to 8,000 miles away. So. Um, you know, the, it's, it's bringing such narratives to life, um, but the question that persists is will it be sustained? Um, so be it live streamed prayer walks or uh, mystical protesting mermaids or TikTok duets, um, they're, all of these examples are not without their downfalls as social media and the re-stories we share present new challenges for environmentalists in their quest to promote change. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, and, you know, infiltrators and corporations also join these online conversations and they move the battleground for the environment beyond the usual protest lines and regulatory meetings into the cyber world. Activists have to navigate disinformation, greenwashing trolls as they are trying to uphold their views. So um, looking to those, uh, those looking to make a change must also navigate what climate scientist Michael Mann refers to as deflection, drawing attention away from the actual ways of making change. Um, and with this comes negotiation of how much information to share and when, in which circles to share this information. So from education campaigns to awareness events, Activists have to grapple with how to move within these online spaces and how to speak for the natural world on virtual platforms. So I'm really looking forward to having more of a discussion. Thank you all for your attention. We'll just need a few moments to get set up again. Um, as I am setting up, I would just like to apologize. Um, believe it or not, I was here half an hour early and was fully set up in the wrong room. Uh, so my apologies for that. My apologies for that. I believe, hopefully, this will be up soon. Yeah, there we go. I could not have asked for a better transition there. Um, what Victoria's presentation was about uh, leads directly into mine. This will be a very data-heavy presentation. Uh, I promise it'll be enjoyable. Uh, but it explores really how much Christians are talking about climate change specifically, how much religious creators on TikTok are talking about climate change and how climate change information is spread on TikTok. So I believe there will be a lot of crossover. Uh, without further comments, <laughs> this is In TikTok We Trust, the double-edged sword of social media in the battle against climate misinformation within American Christianity. Since the early 21st century, social media use has grown rapidly. While only 5% of Americans used social media in 2005, over 72% use some type of social media today. TikTok, one of the latest social media apps, boasts a global user base of over 1 billion active monthly users. Coupled with the fact that 33% of TikTok users regularly use the platform as a news source, it is paramount to understand how this formidable entity can be used to combat the climate crisis. The hashtag, hashtag climate change, currently has 4.3 billion views, and I checked that last night to update it because it grows rapidly. The conversation is already happening on this platform. However, very few of the top viewed videos under this hashtag are from religious influencers. The hashtag, hashtag Christian, has 42.9 billion views, almost 10 times more than the previously mentioned hashtag climate change. Unfortunately, if one were to search these hashtags together, 
the result would be very low view videos with a majority of these videos being against one of these topics, so either against Christianity or against climate change, and about 10% are positive towards both hashtags. In a 2022 study on religious influencers, researchers found that if a religious influencer was seen as credible by their viewers, their social media engagement would, be, would positively correlate. So religious influencers have a power that the average TikToker does not possess. It appears as though this power is not used to engage in positive conversation around climate change. A reason for this could be the lack of conversation around climate change within American congregations. After illustrating this point that American Christian perspective of climate change outside of social media is weak, this paper will seek to prove, this presentation will seek to prove, that the algorithm of TikTok is improving accessibility to reliable climate information. However, religious influencers are practically absent from these positive interactions, from positive interactions with these topics, which is leaving a powerful voice out of the conversation. In the United States, outside of social media, data suggests that there's little conversation around the topic of climate change. In a recent study from Yale, it was estimated that 72% of Americans believe in climate change, but only 33% have heard it mentioned in the past week. In public schools, very few states have legislation which requires climate change education. Through a recent bill, Connecticut was one of the ones to become one of these states, but there are not many out there. But even without this requirement, some science educators still teach some level of climate education. A 2016 study found that almost 75% of teachers allot a class or more to the topic. However, in this same study, it took note that the average teacher uh, only devotes 1.5 hours of education on climate change throughout the entire school year. Beyond this, 30% of the same teachers emphasize that climate change is, quote, due to natural causes and another 12% chose not to emphasize the human causes of climate change. In public, I'm sorry for these peas, people. Um, in public education, as well as public exchange, there's very little conversation about climate change. Furthermore, when discussed, the information about climate change is not consistently reliable, nor the scientific standard. In the public sphere, climate change conversation is sparse, and this is exceedingly true in churches within the United States as well. In Christian communities within the United States, over 78% of Christians who regularly attended worship services, that is at least two times a month, said that there's little to no conversation within their church regarding climate change. Further, 75% 70 of attenders in the same poll indicated that they had rarely, if ever, heard a sermon that mentioned climate change. An important note, this conversation can be positive or negative. So that is 70% of people who have not heard it in either way in their church. The statistics of evangelical Protestant tenders specifically were significantly higher in both categories, with 86% never hearing it discussed in the church and 81% rarely hearing about it in a sermon. Beyond simply hearing the topic of climate change in church, either positive or negative, there's disparity among the generations within religious groups about the level of concern for the climate crisis. Overall, 88% of adults under 40 answered a poll saying that climate change was somewhat or more of an issue, and you can see here somewhat extremely very or not too much of an issue. Um, only 75%, oh, I'm sorry, compared to this average, those who were religiously unaffiliated had higher levels of concern, but younger adults in both Catholic and mainline Protestant denominations were also more concerned on average. Even in evangelical Protestant responses, 75% of adults under 40 are somewhat concerned for climate change compared to older adults who remain at 57%. And if you don't get long enough to see any of this, see me afterwards and I can show you more. Uh, considering this though, if 62% of evangelical Protestants, 77% of mainline Protestants, and 80% of Catholics are all at least somewhat concerned with climate change, why are 78% of Christians saying there's little to no climate change conversation happening in their church? Regardless of lack of communication on this topic with churches, there's at least one place where the discussion is happening and that is TikTok. While social media has now existed for over 15 years, new platforms are still finding innovative ways to attract a user base. As previously mentioned, a 2021 study found that over 72% of Americans use some type of social media. In the same study, researchers found that while only 21% of adults use TikTok, 
almost half of those under 30, of adults under 30 are on the platform. And this did not take into account those under 18, which is a great number, but we don't have the statistics on it. Beyond this, 33% of TikTok users claim to regularly get their news from the app. Compared to the same statistic of Twitter at 53% and Facebook at 44%, this seems inferior. However, TikTok is the only major social media with a notable trend upward of this statistic of users using it as a news source. In terms of percentage of users who regularly get the news from the platform, assuming a progression for TikTok and a regression for the other social media platforms as is trending, um, TikTok is expected to surpass Reddit as a news source by this week, uh, and the data is from August or J September, so hopefully we can get some numbers on that soon if that was accurate. Uh, it's expected to surpass Facebook by mid-October and even Twitter by the end of August in 2025. Uh, and Twitter right now again is around 53%. TikTok's platform is comparatively different than previous social media models, and that's a possible reason why it's attractive to those raised with a social media normative culture. I have to ask right now, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have used TikTok more than a couple times? All right, cool. This next part will be a little important then. Uh, TikTok's algorithm for showing a user videos based on their interactions within the app is the primary way in which a user consumes media through the platform. One author described this as getting, quote, captured by a personalized stream of videos each time that they open the app. Each user has the option to see videos from people who they follow or watch a For You page. As you can see up there, they can click on the option. Uh, and the For You page is content chosen by this TikTok algorithm. Another author went so far as to argue that this algorithm is based on personal interactions within the app, dis allows the user to discover things they didn't even know about themselves. However, one researcher noted that most of the young adults in their study infrequently, barely, liked or commented on videos, but they shared them with friends still. Given this trend, I was wondering, how does this algorithm work if nobody's liking or commenting on a video? How does the algorithm know what to show somebody? So I went digging for that, and TikTok describes their, prop, their platform as, quote, a recommendation platform, and described three main sources of input uh, to which it outputs videos to different users. First, it considers user interaction, which includes likes, comments, shares, and even accounts that a user follows. Secondly, it counts for video information. So this would be the hashtags used under a video, um, the sound of the video uses, or other words in the description or caption. And finally, the algorithm accounts for the device and account settings. So these would be the language preference of the user, the location, etc. I am from the Northeast, and I normally see videos about Boston, New York City. Today, I went on, first thing in the morning, as I usually do, and I was recommended videos about Arizona and Grand Canyon University and things that I would never would have seen because my phone's location is now in this location, and therefore I am seeing different content. Together, these facets allow TikTok to show a user an endless page of unspecified videos curated to their algorithmized tastes. Unless users search for a specific video or creator, they are only shown videos of users that they follow or videos chosen by this algorithm. This facet of the app has been the cause for most truth conversations. While this allows some users to learn information that is factually accurate, it allows other users who might interact with misinformation to be given more of the same. Unless a video is deemed harmful misinformation by TikTok, which is usually regarding health or election information, or otherwise inappropriate and in violation of their community guidelines, there are no parameters to which this video must follow, especially considering the extent of the user base who considers it a news source in coming years. It is vital to consider whether knowledge coming from the platform is factual or simply opinion. The climate change conversation currently happening on TikTok is wildly popular, and there are nearly no rules as to what can be published on the topic. The hashtag, hashtag climate change, currently sits at, again, 4.3 billion views, meaning the sum of all views of these videos under this hashtag are 4.3 billion people who have viewed it, and probably there's some overlap in people. Some of these videos highlight recent climate data change, uh, change in climate data, 
Others illustrate climate activism, and some simply sell green products. Creators post about their anxiety, apathy, or call to action for the climate crisis. Regarding climate change, one researcher suggested that social media is used to bridge the gaps found in inadequate government structures like we described in the public education system. There are many opinions about the content of videos which TikTok's algorithm curates for its user base. However, to fully comprehend the climate conversation happening on this platform, it is apparent that further research needs to be done regarding the content found on this hashtag. In August of 2021, a group of researchers did a study on hashtag climate change uh, on TikTok. At that time, there were 653 million views attributed to this hashtag. Compared to the 4.3 billion today, that seems like almost nothing. This study only viewed 100 videos recently featured on TikTok to determine the content of them. Out of the 100, only a limited amount contained misinformation. Overall, the researchers did note that, quote, the content on TikTok is being updated on a daily basis and is therefore limited by a cross-sectional approach. As I was doing more research on this, and I really wish that there was an updated study with the great amount of numbers that had been added to this hashtag, um, I realized that I could do that study. <laughs> so me and a colleague uh, attempted to do that. As of December 15th, 2022, the same hashtag, which had gained billions of views, totaled 3.8 billion. Again, that is half a billion less than it is today, just two months later. Due to the limited scope of the 2021 research uh, in both how data was collected and how many videos were evaluated, we decided that another study was pertinent. Uh, we created this study using a basis of parameters to evaluate videos under this hashtag, which I will discuss in a moment. And um, due to the nature of TikTok's algorithm and its daily updates, it was difficult to determine how videos were to be chosen for the study. So we decided to perform research on a single day, since the data is changed daily, December 15th, 2022, and viewed all videos that TikTok placed on the trending tab for that day. So that was videos that are ad, um, frequently brought to users' attention that day, uh, which included a total number of 439 videos that day. Um, I viewed all the videos within the study and a colleague viewed a random 20 videos within the study in an effort to gain consensus regarding the characteristics of each video. Only three characteristics out of the 80 in the second viewer's study differed from the original viewer's notes and one of these instances included multiple perspectives on the characteristic. At the time of the study, the hashtag climate change had a total of 3.8 billion views. The 439 videos in the study accounted for approximately 937.3 million views, which is about 25% of the total views. So 25% of the total views under the hashtag were shown to users that day. The videos were posted between December 2019 and December of 2022 but all were trending on this date. And for some reason, there was a very large number of videos posted around early April, 2022. And I have done hours of research and cannot figure out why. It just seems to be a random trend. Uh, also, this, this data does show that they spike around Earth Day each year. Uh, the videos represented 344 unique creators, with 36 creators making more than one trending video with this hashtag. One creator even published 16 of the trending videos from that day. So they were posted on different days, but trending the same day. This chart illustrates the countries with which these videos were either featured or were created from. Only 179 of creators revealed this information clearly. So if it was unclear or if it was unsaid, those are not in this statistic or in this graph. So out of the countries that were represented, this is the data. Um, beyond these provable statistics, however, more qualitative notes were taken as well. Each video in the study was grouped into one of five topics, factual, opinion, activism, green product, and population. This chart illustrates the like and view count of each of those topics among the study. So as you can see, uh, when it comes to view count specifically, 40% of views came from opinion-based uh, videos under this hashtag. Uh, and to make the data clear, uh, in this instance the, um, of the topic, it was fairly similar between like count and view count. And in the following data, we'll see how that's not always true. Um, but you can see the most 
views came from opinion and then factual information and then activism. This chart illustrates the like, oh, further each video was also deemed with an intended perception. Uh, these perceptions were seriousness of climate change, anxiety about climate change, apathy towards climate change, hope in reducing climate change, denial of climate change, factual information, which was purely facts, call to action, and comedy. And a few of them were unclear. If we look at this, we can see that while uh, the majority of views for perception were due to a call for action, almost a third of the views of this study were from calls to action, 37% um, of the likes were regarding videos of the climate crisis, which is just the seriousness of climate change. Um, and you can see this graph here hopefully speaks for itself. For the sake of time, I have to move on, but if anybody wants to see any of these graphs, please let me know. Um, but the main reason that I did the study was to see the religious content under this hashtag. Unfortunately, only 2.5% of trending videos had a religious perspective on this day. 1.13% um, of the total views were from religious content, and 1.91% of total likes were from this content. As this chart illustrates, out of the religious videos that were present, only 17% of the religious views were from a Christian perspective. In terms of likes, that number shrinks to nearly 7%. However, the likes of the videos that were directly attacking or complaining about Christian views of climate change, which are labeled anti-Christian here, received 11% of the views and 36% of the total likes. Yet again, it seems as though religious creators are virtually absent from an important global conversation, and that has serious implications. Based on the studies discussed on this paper, it is clear that climate change conversation is not only occurring on TikTok, but has shared some impactful messages. It has increased the ability of climate activists to share their protests online, as well as organize and spread awareness for their work. It has helped to fill a gap in the public education system and helped to inform adults of subjects regarding climate change they might not hear discussed in public. Although there is still misinformation present, it appears to account for a minority of views and likes among the trending videos. Unfortunately, due to TikTok's algorithm-based uh, platform, those who interact with climate denialism, and I would add climate doomism as well, tend to be shown more of the same, leading to a lack of people being challenged in their beliefs. However, the benefits of climate awareness, cooperation in climate change, and climate change education appear to heavily outweigh the negative effects of miscommunication on this platform. But beyond the effects of TikTok and climate change, we need to consider religious beliefs. Returning to uh, the beginning, to that hashtag of religious creators, uh, Christians were 43, point, 43 billion views. So why are these Christians, on average, who were 73% uh, concerned for climate change not speaking on the topic. And I would argue amazing things would happen if they did. Given everything, Christian influencers and any Christians on social media or in person should be seeking a way to positively impact the conversation around climate change. Secular creators are doing their part, and it's time for religious creators to step up. Thank you. Okay. Thoughtlessness, wrote Martin Heidegger, is an uncanny visitor who comes and goes everywhere in today's world. For nowadays, we take in everything in the quickest and cheapest way, only to forget it just as quickly, instantly. Such thoughtlessness, a racing from one prospect to the next, a temporal movement that never stops, never collects itself, is a consequence of humanity's ever-increasing technological mode of being in and through which we mediate the illusion of a world that is no world at all. To clarify, it is when we become chained to entertainment technologies that stimulate, assail, and drive us, such as the radio and television, 
that we are said to forget the natural world in which we are ontologically rooted, preferring instead to inhabit technologically mediated realms of the imagination. For Heidegger, this thoughtlessness is intimately bound to a type of phenomenological calculation, a fleeting mode of being that plans and investigates in search of imaginative or illusionary, illusory experience, yet fails to meditatively ponder the interrelationality of our being in the world and moreover, the enduring and deep-rooted meanings uncovered there within. Correspondingly, Heidegger contends that in the forgetfulness of calculative thought, we, disconnected and distanced from a world-turned world picture, allow nature to be computationally framed and exploited as a standing reserve of empirical units, an energy source for modern technology and industry that is orderable as a system of information. Thus, taken together, this is the threat modern technology poses to human beings, excuse me, those peas, that in our thoughtlessness, we allow our technical devices the right to dominate us, and so to warp, confuse, and lay waste our nature, construed here as both existential modality and environmental context, all the while denying ourselves a more original revealing, and hence the call to a more primal truth. While Heidegger penned these words nearly 70 years ago, his fears can be found recapitulated in contemporary discourses concerning technologically mediated virtual worlds, particularly those most ubiquitous in the 21st century, those generated and sustained by video game technologies. Placing into conversation Heidegger's thought with that of Thomas Carlson's as it concerns his rendering of the human being as a creature of education, and Alenda Chang's innovative work playing nature, ecology, and video games, the task of this presentation is trifold. First, by appropriating Carlson's novel reading of Max Weber's diagnosis of modernity as an epoch in which we must learn to live up to the demands of the day, a day which in the 21st century is increasingly enmeshed within the techno-virtual, I will elaborate upon a, a form of existential pedagogy at the heart of Weber's disenchantment narrative as it relates to Heidegger's critique of modern technology. Following this, I will utilize the theoretical framework erected by Chang to demonstrate how the virtual worlds tied to specific video games are not merely illusory cultural constructs fo fostering a type of thoughtless escapism, but effectively teach us about ecology and the devastating effects of technological enframement when we choose to play deliberately. Then, in merging these two streams of thought, I will argue that technologically mediated virtual worlds hold the potential to teach us not only of the earth and ecology, but also of ourselves and our existential positionalities within the worlds we dwell, both virtual and corporeal. In accomplishing this task, I will uncover one way in which technologically mediated virtual worlds reveal to us through the play experience a certain negligence, and more importantly, a more primal truth, a truth with religious potential. To begin, we briefly turn to Max Weber's offside in lecture turned to essay, Science as a Vocation. Our age, Weber opines, is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. In the modern age, he says, we are not ruled by mysterious, unpredictable forces, but on the contrary, we can in principle control everything by means of calculation, for we need no longer have recourse to magic in order to control the spirits or pray to them. Instead, technology and calculation achieve our ends. One reading of this influential work fits well with the Heideggerian hermeneutic of modern technology, that in our technological mode of being, through which nature becomes controllable by way of calculation and informatically structured under any number of transient techno-scientific perspectives, we lose sight of a meaningful, value-laden world and our rootedness in it, ergo disenchantment. To elaborate, in addressing the youth of his day, a day perceived as modulated and devoid of any single, stable, and extra-perspectival position, Weber discerns a deep yearning for a leader who might wade through the deluge of factual information and reveal what many believe they have been denied in their everyday lives amidst a technologically determined world, the possibility, the possibility of self-cultivation through meaningful experience. Accordingly, he declares that every individual seeking meaning must do so for themselves, for all chasing after experience arises from a weakness in one's ability to look the fate of the age full in the face and responsibly cultivate oneself in relation to the uncertain and disenchanted world they have inherited. In other words, rather than simply presenting a set of correct propositions about reality, education concerns a type of living practice with respect to temporality, self, and world that through strenuous cultivation, holds the potential to enrich our sense of responsibility for the presuppositions and implications of the lives we lead. 
This, Thomas Carlson reveals, makes teaching an inherently ethical undertaking. For teaching, as he states, is itself a work of passion that awakens the student, sublating their calculative yearning for mere experience, and in turn, opening and binding them to a manner of living the everyday in our day. This, in essence, is how one lives up to the demands of the day. Moreover, much as with Weber, so too with Heidegger. For the alternative Heidegger proposes to calculative thought is qualitatively like the lived practice of learning espoused by Weber. Querying the uncanniness felt by many in his memorial address, Heidegger claimed that it is not the world becoming entirely technical that is at issue, but that humanity is unprepared for this transformation due to an inability to confront it meditatively. In juxtaposition to calculative thought, to think meditatively entails a kind of pondering, a confrontational contemplation of what lies close, on what is closest, upon that which concerns each one of us here and now in the present hour of history, namely, our thrownness in the technologically saturated worlds. Such a meditative thinking requires great effort, demands learned practice, and takes time, yet is not a floating unaware above reality, but an intimate dwelling within that reality, both cultural and natural. In fact, as it relates to entertainment technologies, it is calculative thought, fixed as it is to a cheap chasing after experience, that discursively envelops us within one of these spheres of reality, the cultural, and disbars us from meaningfully streaming between the two, enriching the value of both. What is more, it is too thoughtless calculation that the despoiling of nature is fitted, for without meditative thought, the natural, construed as a present stockpile of material resources, abets the expansion of industry and ennobles mass-mediated consumer culture, nothing more. So in confronting the demands of the day full in the face, we must now ask whether meditative thought can, techno can be technologically mediated, if those illusory worlds we call virtual can in any way teach us how to meaningfully live the everyday in our day, and if in so doing, they can aid us in the dire task of saving the natural world of which we are an integral part. It is to these questions concerning virtuality we now turn. In appropriating scientific jargon to approach the subject of ecology and video games, Alenda Chang employs five concepts, three of which I discuss here, mesocosm, scale, and collapse. In ecology, a mesocosm is an experimental enclosure halfway between unbounded nature and tidy lab setup that grants the researcher a means with which to examine the natural world in a semi-controlled setting. On this ground, a mesocosm is intended to maintain a natural community under close to natural conditions, taking into account relevant aspects of the real world while losing the advantage of, re of, losing the advantage of reliable reference conditions. Within this framework, video games, like mesocosms, are many ecosystems that, in representing some combination of the real and the simulated, replicate select aspects of the player's surrounding world in virtual form. The 2019 puzzle platformer game Plasticity does just this, placing the player within, as the game's director Amy Zhang states, a future plastic-ridden world. As mesocosm, Plasticity takes contemporary socioeconomic and ecological realities and experiments with them by carrying them to their logical conclusions, thereby effectively bringing the player, as Chen claims, face to face with their environmental knowledge and impact, which, in the virtual confines of plasticity, confirms, con concerns the long-term ramifications of single-use plastics on certain Earth systems. Yet, according to Zhang, Plasticity is meant to do more than simply reveal the catastrophic actualities and potentialities of single-use plastics. For after a certain point in the game, ten years pass and the player sees and plays through the impact of their choices. A narratival circumstance meant to engender an experience that can inspire players to care about their environmental impact at scale. While the temporal jump just described is relatively short in ecological terms, the world of plasticity is sent to the year 2140. This temporal setting is by no means incidental, for Zhang set the game in a future that is distant enough to provide a sense of hope and empowerment, but soon enough to remind people that within a few generations the world could be rendered uninhabitable for millions of species, including our own. Echoing this sentiment, Chang suggests that environmental thinking has always been an exercise in scalar understanding particularly as it relates to the virtual environments of video game play, 
as the experience of scale underlies a game's ability to provoke player feelings and precedes the development of a scalar environmental consciousness. Yet, as scale has no neutral or stable value, it is important to recognize what Cheng means when she employs this term. Broadly speaking, scale pertains to degree and magnitude at a system level. In a mesocosm such as plasticity, scale takes on both temporal and spatial dimensions, for one is shown the ecological impact of single-use plastics on the semi-remote future, as well as how this impact is spatially actualized on a city and countrywide level. However, as Cheng states, scale is less significant as a graded system of measurement than as an acknowledgement of interspecies and interobjective re relativity. That is, scale reveals how objects and beings within systems interrelate, and how human agents impact those systems in time and space. It is for this reason that, in utilizing the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, video games, like poetry, can microfy the great, making large-scale spatiotemporal systems and quantifiable processes qualitatively manageable, and hold the potential to magnify the small revealing to us how ecological collapse affects those beings that make up large-scale systems. Moving away from a type of anthropocentrism, the 3D side-scrolling game Endling, Extinction is Forever, released in 2022 by HeroBeat Studios, places the player in control of a fox. But not just any fox. For as game developer Javier Romello explains, this fox is the last known survivor of her species, an Endling. However, after escaping a forest set on fire by an industrial livestock company, the player learns that the mother fox is pregnant. As a new mother of four kits, her goal, and yours, is survival, keeping the cubs out of harm's way while attempting to find them food in an industrially ordered wasteland, which is no easy task. The world in which you find yourself is collapsing, as is evinced by the environmental decline of a nearby river once the bountiful source of nourishment in the form of fish turned waste-ridden and uninhabitable. As a mesocosm experimenting with ecological collapse at scale, both large and small, Enling, as Cheng notes, conflates the physical and moral senses of this term, and is meant to educate the player about climate change, electronic wastes, and mass extinction, while highlighting, as Romello asserts, how, next, how the next generation will have to deal with the consequences of the present. Games such as Endling remind us that collapse has an internal logic, one that does not allow us conveniently to displace responsibility and grants players a means with which to responsibly cultivate themselves amidst a technologically inframed world, a world in which we are interrelationally bound to non-human others. In other words, these games help us to criti critically question not only what is happening or what happened, but more importantly, what am I or even better are we going to do about it? Furthermore. We might also question in an existential register, what am I as a being in the world in relation to a world on the brink of collapse? It is worth noting by way of conclusion that, while I have attempted to elaborate upon ecology in video games, much work is to be done in relation to an ecology of video games. That is, how the mechanical and electronic technologies that make, up, that make video game play possible contribute to contemporary ecological crises as to eschew this question would be to yield to the naive optimism Weber rails against. Nevertheless, video games, as a mesocosmic space existing at the border of culture and, that, and nature, the virtual and the real, the large and the small, experimentally stand at the intersection of loss and hope, and in this position, allow us to think meditatively of the demands of the day when we play deliberately. To this extent, deliberate play, mediated in our day by virtual reality technologies, necessitates a recognition of our current techno-virtual modes of being, yet does so in such a way that, in quoting Carlson, it cannot dictate the ends we choose in life, nor estimate their ultimate value or determine their ultimate meaning, but can aid us, even compel us, to cultivate clarity concerning the positions we hold, and it can thus enrich our sense of responsibility for the presuppositions and implications of the lives we lead. In this way, playing deliberately makes known the virtual's etymological tie to virtue, understood here as a dutiful or ethical binding of self to world, which in turn takes on religious significance in relation to the contested etymological roots of the term religion. As Chang notes in passing, video games have some way to go in actualizing the natural contract Michel Serre would prefer we enact. Yet as Serre himself outlines, relegare means to attach, 
And relegere means to assemble, to gather, to lift up, traverse, and reread. Or in Heideggerian prose, to think meditatively as concerns the natural world to which we are bound, for to do otherwise would entail negligence, a lack of care. This religious diligence against negligence, I contend, can be meditatively cultivated in and through virtual reality technologies, particularly those most refused by the academy and popular culture alike as being nothing more than thoughtless entertainment, video games. Accordingly, video games are well suited to teach the youth of the day, who, amidst a world on the brink of collapse, as is both effectively and intellectually represented in games such as Plasticity and Endling, must learn to play deliberately. Thank you. Well, first, I want to just start off and see, do you have any questions for each other? Uh, if not, then uh, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, there we go. Uh, I just have to say, what you said about the ecology of systems in general <clears throat> caused me to think, and I definitely want to add that to my paper now, of how... TikTok ecologically itself with phones and systems is affecting the environment. So I just want to say that was a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I am. Um, is this thing working? Yeah, good. Um, there, there aren't as many studies out right now that really kind of attempt to quantitatively understand the impact of really video game or really cell phone, well, cell phone probably, but video game creation, whether it's like plastics or what have you that go into them, the consoles, all of these things. But the ones that have been done have shown that, I mean, while there is a reduction of waste in relation to, you know, just downloading a game and not, say, purchasing it physically, uh, even those games that exist on the cloud today are like 10% of the amount of electro electricity consumed in America, which is a pretty intense... Uh, statistic when you're attempting to think really where's where's the middle ground between this and how do we figure that out? I'll moderate this. Yes. Oh, she's got Here a mic. There we go. Um, so thank you so much for this panel. I can't tell you how excited I am and how many notes, I think I put, took 10 pages of notes to uh, use in some of my coursework where I teach on religion and media. All of this was so exciting. Um, one of the real messages I see coming out of this panel, which I heartily embrace and evangelize, is that we cannot leave these digital spaces to corporate PR and marketing teams and bots to dominate and the potential of low-budget DIY videos like the mermaid video, uh, Victoria, that you pointed to, and no-cost videos like TikTok videos um, to really have a disproportional impact. In my own work, I talk about media as putting on the Iron Man suit and having a lot more power than we think we do. And also, uh, if you look at um, Jenkins and uh, Green and Ford's work on spreadable media, they talk about how again and again professional media teams try to manufacture virality in their media works and fail miserably because it's inauthentic and people get it, especially iGen. Um, but many of these videos, like the mermaid video that's quirky like that, does have a vir virality quality that people who have marked marketing degrees have trouble replicating. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention the challenge here in making media that's not just ephemeral in the digital distraction economy, but actually leads to concrete action. And here, I would advocate that we all assign in our courses this type of media making and then use Max Boykoff's research. He's a media researcher at um, University of Colorado at Boulder. He has written a book called Creative Climate Communication, and he tracks what ends up being effective climate communication and what's not. You've got to have ridic ridiculously easy concrete steps at the end of it. 
um, where people aren't just moved by the video, but they're actually doing something, and it's not just clicktivism. Um, but finally, I just wanted to say um, I love the messaging in all three that rather than play and things like TikTok, rather than they're, they're being silly or um, superficial or flippant things, that these can really make an impact, and especially with younger generations, especially if they're not focused on doom and gloom messaging, but they have comedy and humorous aspects. Boykoff talks about how doom and gloom videos just shut people down, put them in climate paralysis, and turn them off. But if we actually interject play and comedy and humor, it creates a kind of cultural lubrication that gets especially younger generations out of climate shutdown and out of climate paralysis and into actual meaningful action. So I'm also wondering if you're, if you're assigning any um, assignments like this to your students. And I'm sorry that was way too long, but very excited about this session. Dr. Taylor just did the entire response for us, so that was wonderful. <laughs> okay, I, can, I have I can, her first. I, I can answer can, that the, about okay, assigning things for students because, um, you know, I was teaching writing for a very long time and I made the mistake of asking this question at the very end of the semester, but it was really helpful. I asked my students, how do you go about writing something? And I thought, you know, maybe they would talk it out or something. They go on YouTube. And they're like, I don't, I don't, if I don't know it, I'm going on YouTube. So like there was a generation that used to go on like Wikipedia or just Google, and now we have an entire generation that is, that's turning to videos as a way of getting their information. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I have started assigning in my classes, I've started assigning podcasts so people can listen to them as they are like going about the rest of their, um, you know, day. And then the other thing is I'm asking them to create a podcast and I'm still it's still up in the air as to like how that's how they're going to like it because I I also think podcasts are they're not TikTok videos they're not Instagram posts but I do think there's a way to engage those those forms of media to relate or at least to get students more interested so I really appreciate the question thank you for these three interesting presentations I think the question of Theodore on who here uses TikTok was right on spot. I noticed that not more than three people raised their hand. So I have uh, two questions, um, mostly for Victoria and Theodore. Could you please tell us more about the demographic characteristics of the people engaged in climate change activism in TikTok? I don't know if it's very, very diverse. And how this online activism translates in real life? Thus, embracing this kind of uh, activism entails making choices, activities in every re everyday life. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, you're asking the statistics on uh, age groups using the platform for activism. Um, I searched so hard for that, uh, but currently there are very little statistics done on. TikTok's user base as a whole, and even less on the people making these videos. Uh, predominantly among the videos that were trending that day, I can tell you that most of the people were either under 30 or were a news corporation account uh, reporting on the actions or activism of someone who was under 30. Um, predominantly, it appears that Generation Z and Generation Alpha are the ones that are playing most of this conversation on TikTok right now. And I can speak a little bit to the second part of your question. Um, that's something that I'm also trying to figure out. I mean, at, at least within my own research in terms of Florida's environmentalists, I know that the people who are creating the uh, videos are very much invested in living out their lives, like advocating in various ways. The responses, that's where I'm trying to figure out, is this actually creating change or is this creating deflection where you know, are people just responding in the sense of like, let's like this, but I'm not actually going to can come out, right? So like, there are many people who would say like, I'm going to that interfaith prayer walk, but the number of people who actually show up, and this has been the case with organizing, I was an organizer prior to getting my PhD, and they would always tell us that, you know, the number of people who say they're actually coming to an event, like you need to calculate it. 
and divide it by like three because those people aren't going to show up. There's like there are people who will say I'm coming to the event, but then they're not actually going to show up. So I think like that's a really great question in terms of what are they actually doing in terms of environmental engagement. And I, I didn't give a really great answer, but it's the jury's still out. Um, on that point, I think there's one statistic that I did find that I feel like is pertinent. Um, adults under 30, so that is 18 to 29 year olds, uh, which is actually predominantly Generation Z now, 52% um, of them get their news from TikTok. So regardless of um, what news they're getting or if it's information or misinformation, we don't know that statistic, but it is clear that over half of the people polled get their news on TikTok. Can I actually follow up to that? Because it's interesting. I One of the things that I do in my classes is I create, I ask students to do this letter to the editor writing exercise where they are going to submit a letter to the editor to newspapers and none of them know how to, they, they don't, they're not reading the newspaper. So they don't know what letters to the editor are. And a lot of them, like when I've asked them in my classes, they are getting, media from, or so they're, yeah, they're getting their news from TikTok because they think it is more, or at least the people, the students who I've had say, it's it's more um, unbiased is their understanding, which is interesting. Uh, quick question, thanks for the talk. Um, my background is engineering. So when I listen to you, um, how do you make the distinction between a belief system in a system based on science, because climate change is a science. Believing in God is a belief. And what happens is, if you talk about Christians um, uh, talking more about climate change, how do you make sure that they don't um, say, okay, it's a belief system? It's not, it's based, it's based on science. So how do you, how do you talk about that? Because they're two different things. Why can't it be both? Yeah, I would argue that uh, people can have both of those things be true. So someone's faith is very much their belief in a deity, um, in this sense, the Christian God, Yahweh. Um, but a belief in science is also important as well. So it is how these people who believe in God are believing in science as well, uh, was what predominantly the data was about. Um, I believe that both can be true. Uh, you can believe in uh, deity and science as well. I guess I'm up. Um, first of all, thank you for a great panel, great presentations. Um, this one's mainly directed towards Michael, and then I have a brief question for the uh, social media oriented aspect to follow up. So um, I really appreciate your presentation and your, your unique um, perspective on video games uh, responding in part to Heidegger's criticisms of technology and I just have some thoughts that are ill-formed because I just heard your ideas which are very novel but um, it strikes me that um, appealing to the mesocosm as an analogy to video games I, I take that's what was happening here or at least derived from Chang I think it might miss a key connection that Heidegger makes between um, experimental science as being the essence of technology and so there that's a, a, a clearly an experimental um, aspect of ecology and so working working out what that means would take a long time but I just want to throw that out there and then mainly insofar as experimental science is, is manipulative and so Heidegger would say something about that that already kind of uh, reveals something about how we interact with the world through a manipulative stance um, there's a lot more to say there but um, I also wonder if it misses Heidegger's analogy of the reservoir that he uses in, in, in his analysis of technology is a constructed space that's cut off from the larger flow of the world and so um, obstructs revealing in, in, in that way. Um, so just a couple of critiques, maybe you want to reply, maybe not, that's fine. Uh, we can talk later. Um, and then briefly about um, uh, the TikTok. I wonder if the moral of the story is that we should engage in the platform. That seems to be what I'm hearing. And I see the pragmatic um, uh, reasons for you saying that. But I, I also wonder if it, it's a platform that we might want to deliberately resist as inherently flawed vis-a-vis -vis some, like some critiques like we might get from McLuhan. Um, so I appreciate the former observation, but my personal stance is to tend towards the latter, um, and that's why I didn't raise my hand when I when you asked, "Have you been on TikTok?" It's so just a thought. That's just throwing it out there. Maybe get a response. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot going on there with the Heideggerian critique, and I think you have uh, valid points, absolutely. Um, I think it gets a little tricky when talking about that, and particularly in relation to what I originally believed was a 15-minute presentation, um, which is why I chose the memorial address, because it's much more digestible in, in, in a short period of time. Um, I think the reservoir, there, there's something to that, which I'd really have to have to dig into in relation to the cutting off of a section of the world, but I think something quite the opposite is happening in video games uh, as mesocosms, um, and I, I, I do not have a science background, uh, this ecology, uh, earth study science, this is all really new to me, um, so there, there'd be something definitely to dig into there, but I think what is happening in video games is very much culturally oriented. Uh, in the sense that what happens outside of them impacts them. There's a reason plasticity was made when it was made and by the people who made it, which is interesting because it was made by a group of students at UCLA uh, during a class, you know, so the entire class was to construct a, a, a game itself. But um, I'll definitely, maybe we could talk after this in more high degrees or something of the sort, but there's something there that I'll definitely have to dig into. Yeah. Um, I also appreciate the comment about TikTok and wondering if we should be engaging with it or not. Um, and I do think that is something to consider that I have not fully considered yet. Um, it is clear that it is trending upwards, that people use it as a news source. So I think it then becomes a question of, even if personally we choose that it is not worth engaging with, is the conversation still going to happen outside of the religious uh, spectrum? Hi, um, I think I have two questions, if I may, if we have time left. Um, the first question is for Theodore, and it's about, um, I think this kind of came up a moment ago, but how do you, when you're looking at this content, how do you, um, how do you distinguish the religious from the secular? Um, so can you I mean, speak of course, up a little bit? Sorry, the religious from the secular in the, in the content that you're looking at? Um, in particular, because there seem to be a lot of activist content, and I'm wondering, I mean, for example, if you see something by like Extinction Rebellion, I don't know if they're on TikTok because I don't go on TikTok, but you know, there's a lot of what I would consider religious content to that, but it might be implicit in some way. So it's really just a question about how you, how you know what you're looking at. And then I had a question for Mitch as well. Um, the category of the meditative, could you just talk a little bit more about that and what, how that sort of um, might keep one rather from becoming sort of immersed in a complacent sort of way or um, almost like to, to, to break off one's chain of thought. Like, you know, the, I was, I'm thinking this in relation to things like wonder that have this sort of quality. Like, how does the person get sort of back out into the non-virtual world with a sense of um, wanting to make it better? I mean, does, does the meditative, you know, somehow militate against activism, I guess, is my question, so. Um, so on the topic of religious creators, I think that there's a distinction to be made between a creator who has a religious affiliation and making something because of that belief, and this study was done more so on direct um, faith-based creation. Uh, and what I mean by that is whether or not a creator claimed that they were Christian on their, um, on their bio or in life, and we just didn't know it. Um, this study looked at what religious voices were saying. So, for example, if someone says they're Christian, but their activism video did not show any of that, uh, that was not taken into consideration. But if a video showed that it was, I do this because God tells us to take care of creation. Uh, then that was what was counted. Um, so I think it is important to note that outside of these direct statistics, people are still using their faith uh, to impact how they create content. It's just not appearing on the site. In relation to the question on uh, meditative thought, well, quite explicitly, it's just not calculative thought, but... Um, there is an aspect, and I, I put this in my presentation, where he talks about meditative thought as being not this kind of floating unaware above reality. And I think in relation to, it's, it's sad to see him just leave, um, the question that was posed there, 
is that I don't think what's happening in these virtual worlds is separated off from the material world. And I think, in fact, and I'm sorry, there's kind of like a Hegelian dialectic happening within these things in which the two come together um, in the individual in some way which really is effective and it's which is why I, I, I focus on video games and virtual reality themselves because I think something extremely effective emotional and experiential is happening at least in the good ones and this changes an individual um, and it changes them very much so when they play it when when it's their actions which are what you know fix the world in some regards say in plasticity I there's an image of uh, the character who's a young lady uh, and a, a little cat who has a bucket on their head. You take the bucket off their head if you'd like, and then 10 years later you meet that cat. And the cat has kittens, and it's kind of cute, and that, that, that kind of feeling stays with you. Um, I'm not so certain. I, th I think wonder is tricky as well, so the, the correlation could be um, deepened, or there could be something there, but I don't know if I have necessarily something to, to speak on it. But I think that's one way of, of addressing the question, how really it's not... It's not necessarily a complacency, and if these games are effectively and emotionally doing what I think they're intended to do, they, they really make a change in the individual, and therefore the point is to hopefully allow them to make a change in the world via that change in themselves. What was that? I, yes. I think that's absolutely it, the turning in words. Thank you all so much for a wonderful panel. My question's for Mitchell. When you're looking at these games that cultivate ethical dispositions, what are some of the things you're looking for in a game that cultivates desirable dispositions? What Wayne Booth calls keeping good company in choosing carefully among our fictional companions. That's a good question. Um, and I don't think there's a particular answer. I think each individual in each video, I mean, I, I don't know. How many people here, let's do the hand raising thing, have played video games before? Uh, yeah, I, when I was younger, Sonic the, the Hedgehog changed my life. Um, and I have actually seen a, a, an online blog where someone attempts to write about Sonic the Hedgehog as being an, a game of ecology. Uh, a little wilderness creature going and saving other little wilderness creatures from a mad scientist. Um, so I think really any game holds the potential for that. But I think the more robust games in which are narratively driven more or less as opposed to say, I don't know, a Call of Duty or something of the sort, really hold that potential. Um, but I would, I would hesitate to put you know, really rigid boundaries on which games can do so. Because I think e each games in their own ways, for ill and good, really can impact the individual to make a change in the world in a particular way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists here. And also thank all of you for your wonderful comments and questions. Please feel free to come up and interact with our panelists if you like for a few moments as we transition to our next uh, event. Thank you. <laughs>